word biomimicry is rooted in Greek. In a nutshell, we can define biomimicry as learning from and emulating nature's form, processes, and systems to solve human problems. However, you may have heard this statement, sorry, you may have heard this statement before. It's not entirely false, but it's also far from being true. Nature deals with complex systems, and most nature solutions are multifunctional. The just good enough for survival is actually the result of optimization among different functions, limitations enforced by the environment, and also the cost of achieving those functions. Therefore, nature systems are cost effective and context specific. In contrast, engineering solutions are often developed within a simplified artificial systems with just a handful of variables and all other health constant. <coughs> Sorry. With just a hand, yeah, all other health constant. So moreover, in, an engineer often pushed to maximize a single design output, aiming for one size fits all solutions. But at what cost? I already mentioned that natural solutions are highly context dependent. The goal for biomimicry isn't to copy nature, but to learn from the principles that nature is using, abstract those principles, and use them within human context. Therefore, emulation would be a better word to capture this additional process of abstraction. So how does biomimicry influence my work and my research? My research is about structural colors. Structural colors are produced by light interacting with nanostructured material. Nanostructures are structures so small that they're invisible to the human eyes. For example, a butterfly wing may look flat but they exhibit nanoscale roughness that reflects and amp amplifies only certain wavelengths of light within the visible spectrum, the colors that we see. This coloration strategy is purely structural and does not require pigments. Compared to pigmentary colors, structural colors are more vibrant and won't fade. By now you may have figured Biomimicry cannot be defined as a single scientific discipline. Rather, it's more like a way of thinking, a methodology, or a philosophy, if you may. It's a framework that can be applied to a lot of different things. Hence, biomimicry is inherently multidisciplinary, and as such, so is my research. My work involves pieces from biology, physics, and engineering. Although I'm not required to be an expert in all these fields, I'm expected to be multilingual and can act as a translator to facilitate the transfer of information and knowledge across disciplines. However, this wasn't how structural color research was done traditionally. Although physicists have been fascinated by the idea of structural color for a very long time, the lack of biological knowledge fixates the research on a handful of well-known model organisms and limit its potential. Take the blue mor morpho butterfly, for example. This species is a famous example for, of structural colors. Physicists have been studying it since the 70s. Hence, we have a very thorough understanding of the optical mechanism behind its color production. In 1997, an engineer had this idea. The color produced by a morpho butterfly doesn't require an active source of illumination. And it's so bright and vibrant that the blue color can be seen from very far away in an outdoor environment. So he thought, this seems to be a good example for energy efficient color display that can be viewed under direct sunlight, such as for your phones, tablets, and smartwatches, and he applied for a patent. After more than a decade of research and, and development, finally, 
the first commercialized model of Morpho-inspired color display came out in the market in late 2009. But until now, you probably haven't seen or heard of a, a monitor like this in real life. Why? One of the reasons is that butterfly-inspired display is highly iridescent. What is iridescent? I think it would be easier for me to show you instead of trying to explain it to you. So just like the shoes that I'm wearing now, iridescent means the color that you perceive changes when you look at it from different angles. As you can see, the morpho butterfly is also highly iridescent. So no wonder a color display developed based on morpho butterfly principles will be iridescent. The solution? Let's go back to biology and try to find a better model organism for this specific application. Does non-iridescent structural color exist in nature? It surely does. There are many tarantulas that have non-iridescent blue hair all over their body, like this one showing on the slide here. This is a side-by-side -side comparison of the cuticle fragments from two different species of blue tarantulas and the tail feather from the common magpie, a colorful bird. So we put our samples on a tilting stage and pointed the camera at head on for the normal incident shots. Those are the pictures in the first row marked 90 degrees. Then we tilted the stage and took photos from different angles. As you can see, the green color from the tail feather started to fade away at 60 degrees and completely disappear at 45 degrees. The blue color from the tarantula hairs remained largely unchanged throughout the full tilt. More importantly, we didn't just study one species of blue tarantula. Instead, we studied many different species of tarantula and tried to find the deep patterns hidden within their long evolutionary history. Among those tarantulas that we have investigated, two of them produce non-iridescent structural colors with a very similar nanostructures. First is this goody sapphire tarantula. At the bottom is what a single blue hair looks like under the light microscope. In the middle of the hair is a scanning electron microscope image. And the circular cutout is the image, is the cross-sectional view of the hair obtained by a transmission microscope. Again, here we see very similar structures in the hairs of a Singapore blue tarantula. At this point, I have formed a hypothesis about how and why the color they produced is non-iridescent based on those new discoveries. However, sometimes it is not easy to test the hypothesis directly using living organisms because there are too many uncontrollable variables and the engineered replicate equivalent to its biological counterpart will be perfect for this hypothesis. Here, for this um, purpose, here biomimicry becomes a means to test and validate a biological hypothesis. And at this stage, we usually make a series of engineered prototype with a controlled, controlled variables. One of them will be the closest biological replicate that we can get, and the others may not look like the biological counterpart at all. Here at the upper left, uh, at the center of the upper left photo there, you see a tiny white dot. That's the structure I designed to mimic tarantula hairs. On the right are what those st structures look like under a scanning electron microscope. 
you can clearly see the resemblance to real tarantula hairs. And when we put them under a light microscope, indeed, we observe blue color, like the photo at the lower left here. So this is still a work in progress. And if you, if you would like to learn more about this work, you can support my experiment project. <laughs> so use my own research as example. You can see that biomimicry isn't a one-way street from biology to human innovation. Instead, it's a constant dialogue, a conversation between biology and engineering or design. Here we started with the engineering problem. How to make a wide angle, energy efficient color display that can be viewed under direct sunlight. Then we go back to biology and found out that the champion model organism for this specific problem may be the blue tarantulas. We performed new research on them and formed new hypotheses. Then we circle back, making engineering prototypes to help us validate our hypothesis. Once we demonstrate that our hypothesis of the biological principle is, is true, and we actually get a pretty firm grasp of it from making prototypes, then this biological principle is ready to be further abstracted or transformed into an engineering or design principle which is ready to be used in the context that is more applicable to humans. And this process, we refer it as the emulation in biomimicry. Therefore, one day, we might get a tarantula-inspired display. But to the arachnophobies in the audience, <laughs> do not worry, the final product will not uh, will not bear any resemblance to its big, hairy, and A-legged inspiration. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>